Since this poem, one of E.E. E. Cummings' most famous, isn't all that long, let's take a quick look to refresh our memories. This way, we'll also have something to refer back to while we discuss it. Since feeling is first, who pays any attention to the syntax of things? will never wholly kiss you, wholly to be a fool. While spring is in the world, my blood approves, and kisses are better fate than wisdom. Lady, I swear, by all flowers, don't cry. The best gesture of my brain is less than your eyelids flutter, which says, we are for each other, then. Laugh, leaning back in my arms, for life's not a paragraph, and death, I think, is no parenthesis. Confused? Don't worry, you're not alone. E.E. E. Cummings' works are often characterized by their eccentricities. For example, you might have noticed sparse or inconsistent usage of capitalization and punctuation. Also, his lines and stanzas in this particular poem certainly have an unmeasured quality, making it difficult to see any definite underlying structure. However, especially in the case of Since Feeling is First, Cummings definitely intended for readers to have a bit of trouble making sense of what was happening in his work. Let's find out why. The first line used to title the piece tells you right up front how fundamentally important a person's emotions and intuitions are, particularly when we're talking about someone who's supposed to be in love. With this in mind, the narrator claims that the person who pays any attention to the syntax of things will never fully connect with or kiss the reader. The use of a semicolon here to cap the line and stanza breaks is significant. Cummings really wants the reader to pause and consider what's just been said. We'll never wholly kiss you. What does that all mean? You may have heard the term syntax, the specific arrangement of words and phrases in forming sentences, in your English class, and this sort of linguistic or literary vocabulary is what Cummings uses throughout the poem to symbolize the use of reason, over feeling, or general mental activity. So the main idea here is that people who are too analytical have trouble ever fully connecting with others on an emotional level. In the second stanza, we find out that these people ironically also seem to have problems with time management, apparently refusing to totally engage with other people when life allows them to do so. In the third stanza, the narrator opens by claiming that his own emotions, blood, can confirm his last statements. He then makes an important comparison that's intended to prove the point even further. When we think of someone wise, we might imagine a judge, or a monarch, or an old monk. All of these symbols of wisdom can come off as rather aloof or detached from personal involvements. On the other hand, locking lips and other forms of physical intimacy are about as personally involved as you can get. By comparing kisses to wisdom, the narrator is saying that a life full of intimacy, physical and otherwise, is a better fate than one given solely to standoffishness, so certainly anyone who would pass up such an experience deserves to be called fool in his book. Though the flowers he swears by might seem insignificant to the overanalytical, Cummings demonstrates that the narrator himself is also insignificant, lowercase i, compared to the importance of what he's talking about. Accordingly, the speaker reassures his lady that he's not of this analytical sort. He claims that her body language and demeanor, eyelids flutter, are better at telling him they're meant for each other than any amount of thought he could put into it, so she should relax and just enjoy their being together. In the last stanzas of the poem, Cummings uses two last bits of grammatical vocabulary. Consider a paragraph. It can be broken down and analyzed, much like we have done with this poem. By simply stating that life's not a paragraph, the narrator's saying that life can't be broken down and analyzed like a paragraph. The second grammatical term refers to a piece of punctuation that you're probably used to seeing everywhere in sets, but when we see a parenthesis alone, it's typically closed. So, when we read that death is no parenthesis, we can interpret it to mean that death is not the end. Ultimately, what we can take away from since feeling is first is that we can't apply reason to things that are by nature irrational. We all try to make sense of love, life, and death in our own ways, but Cummings really seems to think there's no point in it. Many of us might have had trouble seeing the point in diagramming sentences or other grammatical exercises, making them tedious and unenjoyable. By employing terminology used to analyze and discuss grammar, 
Cummings shows that we do the same thing to our life experiences when we overthink them. How we truly connect with the world around us is by feeling it, not by trying to make sense of it. And once we've truly connected to those around us on an intimate level, we're able to make lasting impacts on them. So, if we're able to give up on overthinking everything, since feeling is first, death won't be the last. Since feeling is first, with its title taken from the first line, reflects the characteristic eccentricities of E.E. E. Cummings' work with its irregular capitalization and punctuation and unmeasured lines and stanzas. Cummings also employs words like paragraph, parentheses, and syntax, the specific arrangement of words and phrases in forming sentences, throughout the poem to symbolize analytical processes. Ultimately, the poem and its construction encourage readers to develop a sense of personal intimacy with the world around them instead of just trying to make sense of it all.